everyone feeling? It's like, I usually go to bed by like 10 p.m. So um, we're getting there. This neurons aren't really firing anymore. So I'm the last speaker though. So um, my name's Chelsea. I'm a graduate student at MIT. Uh, and I do research at a center called the Center for Civic Media. And I want to share with you some of the work I've been doing this summer, um, looking at gatekeepers and notions of meritocracy within the tech sector. So um, as many of you probably are very well aware of, um, this chart uh, was recently released by Google uh, now six months ago or so, um, kind of breaking down the demographic makeup of their workforce. Um, and unsurprisingly, uh, it reveals how largely white and male it is. Um, this led to a really positive, I think, domino effect within the industry where a lot of other major companies also went public with their demographic data and confirmed what I think probably um, folks in this community have realized for a very long time, that um, the workforce is disturbingly homogenous um, and there are several groups that are severely underrepresented. <clears throat> As these stats have um, become public, it's, it's really fueled a growing interest in really tackling and taking on some really widespread notions of meritocracy within, within the industry. Um, would anybody like to read this quote? Anybody falling asleep want to want to do their best programmer impersonation and read this? <laughs> Anyone? Okay, fine. I'll read it. Oh wait, we got someone in the back. Go for it. Real quote, y'all. Um, so this quote, I think, really nicely reflects, I think, some of the ongoing conversations that have been going on, really related to, I think, the rise of online open educational resources and the, the idea that pretty much anybody who wants to learn to code these days can and therefore can reap the benefits of this rapidly growing industry. Um, but, you know, um, as, you know, the release of the statistics as well as kind of the ongoing going, growing debate has shown, that's really not the case. Um, so this summer I, I, um, I set out to San Francisco to do some research and that research was really guided by these three questions. Uh, one is, how is the industry diagnosing the diversity problem? What are the pathways that underrepresented individuals are taking in order to pursue careers in this industry? And then finally, how well do those pathways map onto the hiring and recruitment practices that tech companies are using? Ultimately, I really wanted to get at what are, who are the gatekeepers in this industry. In order to do this work, I, I worked with an organization called Code 2040. Anybody familiar with them out here? Great organization. You should check them out. Um, their flagship program is uh, really geared towards placing black and Latino college students in really competitive internships within Silicon Valley. They were really appealing to me because they specifically positioned themselves as a gatekeeper entity. They've done extensive work over the last couple of years of reaching out to historically black colleges, community colleges, um, colleges on the East Coast um, where students um, have less opportunity to really even hear about the opportunities that are available for them within Silicon Valley. So I partnered with Code 2040, got to spend a lot of time with these 27 amazing individuals, as well as um, do interviews with CEOs and head recruiters of a lot of companies that are um, involved within the Code 2040 network. From those conversations, one of the big goals I wanted um, to achieve was really get a sense of what, how are people diagnosing this problem. And after I did several of these interviews, there's one clear diagnosis that kind of rose to the top, which is basically that the reason the tech sector is so homogenous is that we have an education pipeline problem. So for whatever reason, you know, um, women, people of color, other underrepresented groups lack the, the resources and the social supports that they need in order to um, learn the skills that they need to have in order to be competitive within this industry. So subsequently, the, the founders of companies that I were talk, was talking with um, saw their role in fixing this problem as being um, supporters of organizations that are trying to address that problem, provide educational opportunities to urban youth, to girls, et cetera. For me, this fit into a really um, age-old narrative about the role that education plays um, in ongoing issues of inequality within society. Uh, basically saying that, you know, if we, only we could provide better education to 
um, the less the less privileged people within our society, then all of the the issues of inequality would go away. Um, this is also you know, pretty convenient because it gives an opportunity to kind of offload the responsibility, I think, um, to educational institutions uh, and enables people, though, to really um, avoid reflecting on the role that they play within the process. Not saying that the educational pipeline issue isn't an important one. It certainly is, but that's the risk of that being the only explanation for the problem. <clears throat> However, though, there is a lot of resources, out, uh, research that's accumulated over the last decade, several decades um, that have really been charting out the biases that continue to persist in our labor market. Um, a lot of this research boils down to understanding the heuristics that we use to make decisions. So heuristics are basically rules of thumb. Uh, they can come in the form of stereotypes, but they can also come in the form of what you might consider to be common sense that you use basically to simplify the messy world we live in in order to make decisions on a daily basis. Um, these can be really helpful in a lot of situations, but at the same time, when you simplify the world, you also limit the world that we live in. Um, the research specifically having to do with biases within the labor market have shown that the heuristics that we often use can sometimes be as arbitrary or very dis as discriminatory as the racial or gender identity associated with your name or the neighborhood or zip code that you live in. <clears throat> now, these might actually be very um, effective at heuristics at figuring out who the boss is going to get along with easily, but clearly it can also lead to systematic uh, biases and who has opportunity in a given sector. For me, with my research, I was particularly interested um, in the biases that exist and what recruiters call the top of the funnel. So basically, um, how they source and kind of spread the word about job opportunities that are available. I got interested in this because as I spoke to a lot of um, the CEOs who were actively suppo supporting Code 2040's work, a lot of them were explaining to me the frustrations that they had in, in um, not being able to figure out how you get women or people of color to apply to a job. They would post them, try to spread them widely, and they would only get white guys applying. And subsequently, they thought, oh, there's an education pipeline problem. Um, I really wanted to get past that narrative, though, and really think about, OK, what are the heuristics that you're using, and how are those affiliated with specific gatekeepers that might shape who even finds out about your job, who thinks they might be competitive for the job? What I found was um, the heuristics that are used are kind of the age-old methods that we've been using for a long time in a lot of sectors and that we've identified as problematic. So the first one being social networks, going to your friends, your colleagues, and asking them to spread the word, paying large amounts of money for people to recruit people that they know into the jobs. Clearly, though, um, well, I'll get into that in a second. Second one, ed educational pedigree. Go into the usual subs <coughs> suspects of MIT, Stanford, other places and recruiting there, but not really... Uh, broadening out your um, your recruitment efforts. And then finally, prior work experience, um, falling within the big hierarchy of kind of like, who are the name brand sexy companies where people have worked? If you haven't worked at one of those, then we don't, we don't really know a lot about your past. Um, those heuristics um, <coughs> really lead to kind of a compounding effect. Um, uh, you know, especially within kind of a startup culture where people are trying to run really lean from the beginning, they're going to lean on these kind of old school ways of sourcing talent. But what that means is that 50 employees in, you might look up and realize everybody looks exactly like you. Um, so it can become challenging to really you know, figure out when is the right time to make a diversity move? Is it at the beginning? Is it in the middle? Is it at the end? I spoke with one um, CEO. He's, he's grown his company to 60 employees, not a single female employee yet, because he says the minute they walk in, they turn around. <laughs> so um, this can be really challenging, but at the same time, um, I, there's a widespread expectation that this isn't going to change unless you can come up with easier, easier ways to get this done. However, um, something that is, I think, an exciting moment right now within the tech sector is that I think there is more and more conversation going on about how ineffective these methods are. 
as the industry is really growing, literally the peop companies can't find enough talent to fill the spots that they have. Salaries are skyrocketing as people are poaching people from other companies. And then perhaps best of all, there really is, I think, a growing conversation happening right now, a larger and larger community growing, really talking about um, the inacceptability, if that's a word, of, <laughs> of the homogeneity of the, the sector. <clears throat> So as a result, what I've observed in my research is that there's a really interesting kind of emergence of a new set of gatekeepers who are trying to really shake things up and provide an alternative. Um, these gatekeepers are what I call algorithmic recommendation recruiters. So what they do basically is they scrape internet, like information from the internet of people's behavior and try to passively construct profiles um, of of what skills they have, but also um, as, like um, assumptions about their personality and their work ethic, in order to recommend people to um, companies that are looking to hire people. So this is this isn't like LinkedIn, where it's a database full of um, full of resumes or anything like this. This is a system in which people are um, developing basically surveillance methods to collect information about people who haven't necessarily opted into the system. And there are some potential benefits to this. Um, um, some of the, the <clears throat> most interesting ones are directly related to the issue of the gatekeepers. One being that you could scale up beyond kind of the homogenous local group that you've been overtapping for many years um, and really go to other parts of the country. Uh, one, another interesting one is, is really, though, decoupling competency from degrees and credentials. So as many of you who probably work in, as web developers or engineers know, a lot of the most marketable skills that are out there right now aren't things that CS departments are teaching at universities. <coughs> so as a result, um, there's a lot of learning that is going on in less formal channels that um, people want to figure out how do we identify and use that as an effective uh, measure of competency. And then finally, I think the most radical of them all is really um, broadening and redefining the metrics that count. Um, I think uh, most of the, the folks that I spoke with um, acknowledge that actually um, your, your um, technical ability to execute a certain task in a certain language or whatever is really not nearly as important as your ability to work um, effectively with other people to communicate what you're struggling with, to be able to kind of do some metacognitive things of searching uh, for the answers to questions you don't know. Those are things that are really hard to evaluate, that people are starting to begin to develop methods to understand based off of your behavior online. Um, clearly, though, I think there are some very serious risks that are affiliated with this kind of, this kind of emerging method. One is a new myth of objectivity, this idea that the, the numbers or the data that we collect is going to yield more insight um, than any of the other methods that we've, we've used before. Um, another one is discriminatory profile optimization. Um, so um, finding characteristics that don't have any clear relationship to the job at hand, but you can find a correlation to high job performance. So an example of this would be I spoke with a woman who is developing um, an algorithm specifically for founders of companies or, or potential CEOs. And she said there was a high correlation between listing uh, To Kill a Mockingbird as one of your favorite books on Facebook and high retention rates within, comp uh, within tech companies. She wanted to use this to source unconventional people to that job. Clearly, though, like... That the, this cultural and social capital associated with having to kill a mockingbird being one of your favorite books is really going to shape the profile of who, who that is, you know. Um, so that that's that's a big risk. Another one though is one um, that Alastair uh, Kroll has coined um, as 21st century redlining, basically denying or giving opportunities to people based off, again off of seemingly unrelated facts. So he he does research into how financial institutions such as banks um, or uh, loan people, loan givers, um, deny, people, um, deny people credit uh, based on, say, where they shop and that people in this neighborhood who shop at these stores don't pay back their loans, so we're not going to give you a loan. These are these are clearly have some um, really big implications for like the future of civil rights and equal opportunity. Uh, 
another big risk is kind of the amplified effects of online harassment or discrimination. Um, even though we have the open and free net, clearly it's not a place where everyone is um, <coughs> welcome in all venues. So particularly if uh, these companies are looking at, say, for example, your GitHub profile or other open source platforms where people are collaborating. Uh, that might seem to make a lot of sense, but I think we also need to have a critical conversation about the modes of discrimination and, and social practices that exclude different people from these communities and then would therefore impact their ability to show up on these radars. And then finally, just the general offloading of civic and moral responsibility to a third party entity that is an algorithm is also a big concern. Um, as I was mentioning before, there already seems to be a resistance to um, being reflexive about um, the role that companies and recruiters uh, play within kind of this uh, ongoing um, perpetuation of the white guy in the office. Um, so without a more reflective conversation about these issues with the people who are using this, there's a real big risk that we could just, again, offload the responsibility to some, something else. Um, so anyway, I'm glad that these are all such a hit. Y'all are a great audience. Um, so anyway, my goal really today is really just to give you guys a glimpse of what I think are currently the gatekeepers um, that are at play within the tech sector, but also um, some of the potential consequences of some of these emerging, um, these emerging tools and methods that we're using um, so that we can start to have conversations about that in the future. Anyway, that's it. I, I doubt I have time for any questions or anything, but okay. Oh, I guess <laughs> well, we're done. That's why I'm clapping. <laughs>